Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear colleagues, everybody, welcome and welcome to everybody that is coming in from outside. Fantastic to have you all here in person once again. My name is Maria Ramos. I'm an anchor at TRT World and it is so good to have you here again in person. It was fantastic to speak to so many of our students here yesterday. I spoke to people from Yemen, uh, Iraq, Libya. Uh, it is great to have you here. I just want to also give a round of applause to our audience because you are fantastic. These are our future diplomats, our future politicians, our future panelists as well. It's really fantastic to have you here. Now, and of course, for those of you who have come in from outside Istanbul, so many have traveled from afar. Istanbul, Hoşgeldiniz. Welcome to Istanbul to all of you who have come in from outside. Now, we are going to be talking about the Russia-Ukraine war. It started on the 24th of February. I remember I was in Istanbul airport. I was flying home to London. I looked up and I saw all the flights canceled. Flights to Kyiv, flights to Odessa canceled. I thought, wow, this is really happening. And even before then and since then, it has been, I would say, our top story at TRT World nearly every day. This is such an important subject for Turkey and, of course, for our channel, given, of course, the country's geographical position. The Black Sea is just up there. And, of course, Turkey's fantastic diplomacy in the Black Sea Grain Initiative uh, mediation. A very important subject, ladies and gentlemen. And for that, I am very pleased to announce and welcome our distinguished guest here today. I'd like to start by introducing the Honourable Member of the European Parliament, Mr. Richard Czarneski. Welcome to you. And next we have Thomas Greminger, Director of uh, the Geneva Centre for Security Policy. Ambassador Greminger, welcome to you. Evarist Bartolo, former Minister for European and Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Malta, welcome. And Bruno Massaj, best-selling author and former Secretary of State for Europe in Portugal, welcome to you. Join me in welcoming him. And Kilic Bura Kanat, Research Director for the SETA Foundation, welcome to you. All right, let's start. So I want to start with you, Thomas, because you have just got off the plane from Moscow. What are, what are the Russians saying? What is the plan? I think there is uh, no plan, at least for the short to medium term. One second, I'm just going to push your mic. Oops. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm afraid uh, that the perspectives, at least in the short to medium term, are not particularly bright. Uh, um, I think uh, leaders, uh, both, but in particular also the Russian leader, uh, they have positioned themselves uh, um, in corners. Uh, I think they're uncomfortable in these corners, but they don't really know how to get out of this corner. And this is, uh, I'm afraid, uh, the most likely scenario, uh, I would say, for the months to come, is a continu continuation of high-intensity warfare. Um, I think both sides believe that uh, 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 the military momentum is still on their side and uh, uh, the Russian uh, armed forces will continue to try full control of the annexed uh, territories while uh, the Ukrainian armed forces believe they can uh, liberate uh, the occupied uh, territories. And uh, I, I don't think that, is, that, that this is uh, going to change uh, uh, in the short term. Perhaps at some point we will see uh, attrition on both sides with exhaustion, uh, a transition to something of a low intensity mm -hmm. uh, a conflict, perhaps even with a weak ceasefire, um, but uh, not, not for the moment. And what comes thereafter, well, I think we can only reflect in scenarios. Uh, there is definitely a scenario of further escalation, yeah. but there are also other scenarios, you know, uh, including that one of the sides um, wins at the war militarily. I 
don't think that it is particularly likely. Uh, there is a possibility that this drags, this conflict drags on for years, even for decades. But I wouldn't exclude, uh, of course, also a, a negotiated end mm -hmm. to the war that is perceived to be fair by the key stakeholders. Absolutely, Thomas, fantastic point. And we will get to, to how this ends, how we get out of this. But thank you so much for giving us a, a sense of uh, what is fresh there in, in Russian thinking. Thank you so much. I want to ask you as well, Bruno, you go a, a lot to, to Ukraine. What is the feeling there? What is, where are we now there in Ukraine? A great feeling of, of resistance. Uh, if you could put your mic a bit closer to national, you. Yeah. National mm -hmm. spirit, patriotism, a sense that this war didn't start in February, it didn't start in 2014. This is a war that goes back centuries for Ukrainian independence and sovereignty. This is how Ukrainians think about it. A history full of heroes, of people who sacrificed for, for their country's freedom, and the new generation see themselves as part of this struggle. So I saw already in February that uh, Russians were very deceived if they thought Ukraine would be easy to beat. Uh, Ukraine is fighting for its past, for its future. And also Russia made it so clear that the alternative is either the kind of destruction we saw in Busha or Mariupol or then resistance. So Russia itself left Ukraine with no alternative but to resist. Uh, that's been the spirit and I think it will continue. Uh, obviously that surprised many people that Ukraine has been able to put up such resistance against what one still considered the second most powerful military in the world. And many people made the prediction that Ukraine would not last three days. Mm -hmm. But it's clear now that it's Russia that has a serious problem of its hands, and it's Putin that has to try to extricate himself from a conflict that it's very clear now Russia cannot win. Russia, Russia cannot, cannot win. win. That's, that's a very bold remark there. It's clear that Russia cannot win. Why do you say that? Um, resistance, the, the Ukraine is much more confident, uh, much more prepared. I remember back in February uh, when Ukrainians were able to f shoot down some helicopters, Russian helicopters mm -hmm. at Hostomel Airport. There was a sense of jubilation and relief. We can do this because confidence was not that high at the beginning. Since then, Ukraine has had military victory after military victory. Mm -hmm. Confidence has gone up. The army is much better prepared than trained. And Russia, on the contrary, uh, has suffered enormous losses in equipment and, and, in, and in, uh, in, in men. And I just want to look at what happened this week, because when we hear that Ukraine manages to attack inside mainland Russia, this sent a chill down my spine. And I just want to put that question uh, to you, Evarist, uh, because we were talking outside about there not being support maybe to extend this. but. How dangerous is this point at where we are now, where they're, they're reaching mainland Russia? Yes, I think it's dangerous. And as uh, Thomas was saying, uh, I know that this morning somebody was saying we have a month ahead of us where it's uh, religious festas, uh, perhaps the holidays will mm -hmm. help to make people think, reflect, calm down. You think well, Christmas could make them no, calm well, down? Well, whereas in fact the, the signs are mm -hmm. that this month is going to serve to actually become more fierce after the holidays are over. So after and Christmas, in, in fiercer. After Christmas, unfortunately to expect things to get, to get worse. Now, where will the line be drawn? Uh -huh. Where will the line be drawn? Because if it escalates further, involving other countries, then that is really, really, really dangerous. And I think one of the reasons why, first of all, uh, when you ask how, how do they react, how do people react from both sides, and especially, I think, from the Russian side, there are obviously two parallel discourses going on, one which is official, this is why we're there, you know, we've been threatened, this is a defensive war, uh, you know, we have, to, we have to push back. Yeah. Um, but then, privately, it's a completely different approach and saying, uh, we are overdoing it. We are overdoing, overdoing it. it. And Russia is overdoing it. So yes, you're saying they, and, just for clarity, and, and Russia and what, and what, yes, says and that they are overdoing they it. They are overdoing it. And what I think is unfair, I mean, I come from a very small country. Malta. Malta is you know, 
Istanbul on its own is 16, 16 times larger than, uh, than Malta. We do not want to live in a world where yeah. might is right. Yeah. So for us, it's very important that, you know, uh, you cannot simply invade a country and uh, force another country to do what you want. So uh, this, is, this is, and it's unfair to punish the Ukrainians, even, and I'm ready to discuss that the West should have treated Russia with more respect towards its security concerns. I am ready to, to discuss that seriously that you know, we, we did not take them seriously. But you shouldn't punish the Ukrainians to the level that is happening now, not just human suffering, but also the destruction of a country. It's as if you want to push it to ground zero. You I mean, know? Uh, when I speak to my correspondents, that are, those of you that are watching us on TRT World, they're there in pitch black. No water, no energy, no, and the people a, living. Forty percent uh, of the Kyiv region has uh, had, had no power, has no power. Um, We'll leave it there for a moment, but I want to come to you, Mr. Czarneski. You are an honorable member of the European Parliament. Uh, you're from Poland as well. A missile landed in Poland very recently. Um, what did that do to, to the war in, in Ukraine? And what lessons have been learned from that, if any at all? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, firstly, Thanks a lot for inviting me for this uh, important and uh, prestigious conference. Uh, answer for your question is very simple. Uh, it's not only war of Ukraine, it's also war of Western world, uh, because Ukraine is part of uh, our uh, European civilization. Uh, um, and uh, uh, we must support this country in our European interest. Uh, for example, my country, Poland, uh, 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 invites, open the hearts and, and doors for not uh, camp for refugees, but for private home, private flats for almost 7 million of refugees. And now it's about 4 million because part of them uh, came back to, to their motherland, to, to Ukraine or to other e e European countries. Uh, but also we offer uh, huge uh, aid, uh, uh, um, uh, estimate 3 billion US dollars, mm -hmm. uh, uh, huge military uh, support, 1.8 mil billion uh, US dollars uh, also. Uh, but I can repeat, it's not charity action, it's our interest. Uh, uh, I think we are politicians and we should speak about uh, uh, also politics here. Uh, I think uh, we should support also aspiration of Ukra Ukraine to European Union, mm -hmm. to NATO uh, in the future. Obviously, we expect a very clear message from, from our neighbors, from Ukraine in this issue. And how is that going? How is that conversation going to get Ukraine into NATO and in the EU? And how long? Any timeline? Well, I'm not Prophet Richard, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, obviously, uh, but uh, my country uh, uh, wait for access uh, uh, about 12 uh, years. Uh, Turkey uh, has a little bit longer experience in this issue. Uh, Western Balkans country, uh, for example, Serbia and uh, Montenegro uh, wait. Uh, Still waiting. Yes, uh, 15 or more years. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem, f one uh, uh, personal memory. Mm -hmm. When I was uh, Minister of European Affairs uh, in Poland, in the uh, cabinet of Prime Minister Buzek, uh, during the British presidency, I uh, visited uh, my British colleague, uh, Mr. Douglas Henderson. Uh, he was uh, Mr. of European Affairs in the first cabinet of uh, Tony Blair. And I asked him, uh, Doug, what do you think? What is the main problem of my country, of Poland, in this uh, negotiation, accession negotiation with the European Union? After one minute silence, uh, Doug, uh, Douglas Henderson uh, asked for me, size. I think uh, I would like. Uh, please hear my uh, friends from Turkey, um, friends from Ukraine also. 
the size it can be problem for this negotiation uh, for some important EU players. Uh, because uh, absolutely easier open the door uh, of European Union for uh, 700,000 uh, uh, cit citizens of uh, Montenegro or f six or seven million uh, of uh, population. I have, Serbia, I have Malta and, and uh, Turkey are laughing here, smiling. But, yes, but, but obviously we should support uh -huh. access of Ukraine, uh, especially a uh, country like Poland. Uh, we are neighbors and, and we support strongly uh -huh. this access. Thank you so much. I just want to get a quick reaction here because I saw uh, from both of you. Um, Kilic, your reaction to what uh, the Honourable Member uh, Czareski just said there. That's another, that's another panel. That's another panel. Big, a huge debate. That's a totally other panel Absolutely. to discuss Turkey's membership process. But I think the, uh, the, the war itself actually demonstrates the significance of Turkey for the European Union as well and the diplomatic success of Turkey and the role that Turkey has been playing since the beginning of the war actually shows that uh, why Turkey is so important mm -hmm. and why it's important for NATO and why it is important for the European Union as well. And what I lessons have been learned in that, that, would you say? Lessons, I think uh, we, about the war in Ukraine, we almost have a lesson fatigue right now. <laughs> Starting from the first day of the war, we constantly see overestimation and underestimation of one of the powers and at the end of the day from the first week on we have seen tons of articles analysis showing us the lessons i think there are old lessons to be remembered and new lessons to be learned and there are some old lessons that we had to know it earlier number one don't invade another country right and united states felt this in iraq and afghanistan Soviet Union felt in, in Afghanistan before. So don't invade a country. I think it is fairly simple, a lesson to be remembered. A second lesson to be remembered is war has so many uncertainties. To expect a linear collapse of an army, especially in a conventional warfare. Now we are seeing an artillery warfare in uh, Ukraine, but it is much more complex. There are so many uncertainties. Mm -hmm. You have to take into account economic capacity, industrial capacity, and the most important thing is the will of the power, uh, people to defend their countries. I think this was underestimated in Vietnam and this is underestimated in Ukraine as well. And there are some lessons that needs to be learned after this. Number one, war is now much more complex. We used to talk about fog of war, but now it's much more complex. Since the beginning of this war, we have seen cyber war, information warfare, and asymmetric warfare, and almost a proxy war at the same time, a militia war in the East. So this is a rather complex mm -hmm. phenomena right now. Let me bring you specifically to the lessons learned in, in diplomacy with regards to Turkey and the fact that, that it speaks to, to both countries. And earlier in the break, I was speaking to you, Thomas, and uh, also uh, to you, Evaris, about the fact that, that it is good that we have other voices as well. But just very briefly on that, what do you think well, uh, is important? Well, that's another lesson to be learned, briefly. actually. Number one is... For the outside world. ...about the international national institutions that Turkey has been raising the issue of UN reform for a long period of time. And the fact that the, this, the announcement by Putin to invade Ukraine took place when UN Security Council was having a basically meeting to resolve that crisis demonstrate that we definitely need to have a reform of the EU, uh, UN Security Council, especially when the, one of the attacker is a permanent member, it becomes a totally difficult organization to, uh, to achieve something. And secondly, another lesson that, le that was learned and Turkey involved is the wars is now have much more integrated outcomes. Mm -hmm. And food crisis, oh, yes. energy crisis, all of those demonstrate that these are important crises that can come as a result of these mm -hmm. wars. And the middle powers like Turkey can play significant roles in this. We have seen in the grain deal, we are seeing right now in the attempts to resolve the energy crisis, mm -hmm. and maybe we will see in fertilizer crisis the same Absolutely. success. The diplomacy is the key to resolve some of the crisis in these kind of conflicts. Thank you. Thomas, is what Turkey has done, is doing valued 
from the outside, and, and given the, the attention and value that it should? I think it is. That will be the short answer. Um, but I would very much you know, support this notion that in a very polarized world, and I think uh, this polarization is something that we've been seeing now for quite some years, but it's uh, on the increase uh, and not on the, on the de decrease. And in such a situation, you need countries that uh, are uh, ready to offer these uh, platforms for inclusive dialogue, that are ready to bring non-like-minded stakeholders to the table. Um, um, and particularly when we talk about uh, a war with the stakes, uh, uh, with the scope of, of stakes, uh, as we currently see uh, in Ukraine, uh, I think uh, you need more than just a classical mediator. And, and I think here Turkey comes in as a facilitator that has the political clout to, to be taken seriously, uh, that has access uh, to the heads of states, and uh, that, that can play an extremely uh, useful uh, role. I think uh, the role is definitely in the expert community very mm -hmm. much acknowledged. Uh, uh, um, I, I'm not sure what the Turkish perception is in terms of acknowledgement uh, 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 given uh, on more in, in a more official mm -hmm. setting, but definitely uh, among us experts, I think uh, we are full of admiration, mm -hmm. and I think that's an important role um, also in the, so the days, months, and are, years to come. The experts are full of, of admiration. I'll just come to you, Mr. Czarneski, on this. Is the EU also full of admiration for what Turkey is doing with regards to Ukraine and Russia, the diplomatic successes? Well, uh, uh, I would like to uh, inform that uh, we uh, made agreement with Ukraine, Ukraine on the uh, way to access to our country and the uh, European Union showed a big solidarity with uh, this uh, country uh, uh, and uh, in my opinion the Russia uh, understand only one real argument, argument of power uh, and obviously we support uh, diplomatic negotiations uh, and we need diplomatic negotiations, but uh, we cannot, as the Western world, press for Ukraine uh, for resignation from uh, their territory. And if some uh, biggest European countries uh, would like uh, offer this strategy, strategy, I think, for example, Poland and Baltic states and uh, Scandinavia countries uh, will be absolutely against. Uh, we must uh, uh, support Ukraine uh, also uh, about uh, uh, aspiration to come back to Crimea, Donetsk and Lugansk. Mm -hmm. It's very important. The, I think the, there's no alternative. But specifically with regards, going back to what Turkey is doing, are they doing a good job with regards to their diplomacy? We were together in Brussels very recently discussing the grain deal. Well, um, uh, generally, more general remarks. Uh, I would like to say that uh, um, now we have very uh, special time, special challenge, uh, because uh, uh, we should remember our mistakes, our Western world mistake earlier. Look for 2008 and uh, summit of NATO, not you in uh, Bucharest, the capital city of, 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 of Romania. And uh, two countries, United States and Poland, propose a very concrete roadmap, a road, a roadmap for uh, Georgia and Ukraine access to uh, NATO, NATO organization. And uh, three countries were absolutely against, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Germany, France, and Italy. And uh, finally, uh, uh, we cannot agree together, and we didn't offer uh, Tbilisi and Kiev uh, very concrete uh, dates for uh, their accession. Mm -hmm. uh, after a few weeks uh, after this summit, uh, Russia 
uh, 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 attack of Georgia uh, and occupied part of uh, uh, Georgian territory. Uh, and uh, I think it's the good homework for us now. Uh, and uh, uh, we cannot agree uh, for uh, peaceful negotiations, which means uh, a step back for our Ukrainian neighbors. I want to move on now, thank you so much, and, and ask how do we get out of this war? What is being actually done? What discussions are being done to, to end this war right now? Um, Evarist, what, what are you hearing? And that it's very early to talk about some kind of cooperative security which will, because peace doesn't mean the absence of war, obviously, and it doesn't mean the you know a ceasefire those are important as first steps mm -hmm. but the two sides have to come to a reality where it will be mutually harmful to continue fighting we're not there definitely we're not there um, and both sides i think are digging into their positions deeper one side will not want to give in, and the other side, which is losing territory and which obviously have a right to resist being invaded and being taken over and being dictated to, it is going to be interesting and not just academically interesting, at what point will there be talks and to what extent will the map be redrawn after what has happened on the 24th of February, and whether, how far back, mm -hmm. the boundaries will be pushed to get some kind of cooperative security. What is definitely the case is that unless we want, and we were, I mean, not smiling, but unless we want a situation where you have a frozen conflict like North Korea, South Korea, mm -hmm unless there is some kind of cooperative security arrangement where Ukraine will feel safe within its borders and with its sovereignty and territorial integrity respected. Yeah. And unless Russia feels the same, we won't have a resolution. I know, as you said, this has been going on for centuries. And, and it will continue to go on unless we unless we find this kind of cooperative security. Absolutely, and of course, Thomas is the security expert, but just before I come to you on, on how we, what sort of framework for security we could have, um, Bruno, a, a comment we, you, you said when we were discussing earlier, do we even understand what type of war this is for us to even know how this ends? Agreement. Uh, now my personal opinion is this is a classical imperial colonial war, where a great colonial power tries to subdue, occupy, and incorporate a smaller country. Some people have compared it to the War of Algeria, where France was trying to do that. And we, we tend not to think of Russia as a colonial power for whatever reason, probably because its empire is contiguous. It's not an overseas empire. But in fact, Russia is a colonial empire and regards Ukraine as a colony. And in fact, Putin uses all the classical tropes of imperialism and colonialism. He says that Russia invented Ukraine. Ukraine did not exist before it was created by Russia. This is what uh, the British Empire used to say about India. But what is interesting is that this argument that seems obvious to me, when I go to India, I've been going a lot to India this year, uh, people don't agree with this. I have to be honest and say all over the world there are different views. And in India, you, you hear more commonly that this is a war created by NATO. And this is geopolitical war for the world order. So there continues to be disagreement. And those of us who have a clear view on what is happening uh, will continue to, to make our case. But I think it's important because the resolution to the war depends on what kind of war it is. Uh, and if it is, in fact, a colonial war, Russia has made it clear, the Kremlin has made it clear, President Putin has made it clear that the final goal is to destroy Ukraine not only as a state, but as a nation. If this is the final goal, then it would be irresponsible of President Zelensky to accept any peace agreement that will in fact mean 
giving the Kremlin more time to recover its forces, recover its army, prepare for another invasion within a year or two. That's why I'm pessimistic about a peace agreement. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think Kiev understands very well that a, a peace agreement would be irresponsible from the point of view of Ukraine's survival. So the war will go on and perhaps intensity will reduce, perhaps we'll have a frozen conflict, but I don't believe in a peace agreement because the nature of this war is a colonial war of destruction. And, and if, I, if I may, yes, far and away. we need a peace of the living, not a peace of the dead. A peace of the living, yes. And not of the dead. Indeed. No. Indeed. Thomas, what will this uh, look like? What will uh, Ukraine look like? What mechanisms do we have to have in place? Let's say when the war ends, I, I want to use that word and think optimistically, not if, but when. And how do we police that, of course? I, I think uh, what is uh, fundamental is the kind of end uh, to the war that we will have. And uh, here I would totally agree with the two uh, previous speakers. This is uh, very much a function of uh, what agenda is uh, driving Russia's motivation. Is it, as it was pretended uh, for years, is it a um, security-driven uh, mm -hmm. agenda uh, or is it a revisionist neo-imperial agenda? If it's the latter, it will be very difficult to come to any uh, um, end of the war, you know, that would allow us to reconstruct um, a, a European or even a global security order that is based on some elements of corporate but security. But do you see it ending soon? I, I, I think at some point we will come to an end, but the end could very well be some sort of a protracted conflict, low intensity warfare, but, uh, but perhaps not so different from what we've seen in, seeing in the Donbass since 2014, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps relatively low uh, rates of ceasefire violations, but still an ongoing conflict that is politically not resolved. Um, I think that's one potential uh, way forward. But even in such a situation, we would uh, need to have you know, some, some rules. Um, um, the, the better case, the, the best case, is at some point a negotiated end to the war that satisfies uh, key stakeholders. And that would obviously include Ukraine. Um, and that is difficult to imagine at this point because you have so many difficult political issues uh, that would have to be resolved on a negotiation mm -hmm. table right now. But if uh, we you know, get to that point, I think we would have fair chances to reconstruct the European security order. And I think we have... Uh, to reconstruct it, sorry to interrupt, to the point that this doesn't happen again? I think there are, at least uh, in terms of substance, uh, there are building blocks. In terms of process, there are experiences. Look, in the 70s, when uh, European uh, states, uh, the United States, in midst of the Cold War in 1972, uh, uh, engaged in launching what then became the so-called Helsinki process. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, tensions were extremely tough, uh, um, but there was a commitment you know, to, to manage the Cold War and to come uh, to some uh, rules and, and principles. And, uh, and some of the things that worked then could, in theory, again, mm -hmm. uh, work provided there is a, a political commitment uh, uh, by key stakeholders. Mr. Czerneski, what's being discussed in the EU? What are you hearing? What's being said to end this war? And do you even think it will end soon yourself? Well, um, also my answer uh, will be also add some remark to, to my um, predecessor. Um, uh, I don't believe, and I think many of us don't believe uh, in fundamental uh, peace treaty between Ukraine and Russia. I think most probable scenario is the ceasefire and or break uh, for short or medium term uh, in uh, military action. Uh, it's maybe similar situation like between 2014 
to uh, February 2022 uh, between Ukraine and Russia. Um, um, I think it's uh, really probable, uh, um, but uh, I cannot imagine, I'm not a diplomat, uh, truly speaking, I cannot imagine a situation that uh, Ukraine can resign from Crimea, not only Crimea, mm -hmm. but a good example, uh, uh, and also Russia resign from Crimea. I think we expect maybe uh, not uh, mm, uh, 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 military conflict to the end of the uh, to, uh, end of the world, uh, mm, uh, never-ending story, but is the uh, uh, absolutely for very long term. Uh, for very long term um, and and well it also depends of our mm -hmm. attitude to th this war uh, frankly i observe we can observe the that our society is more and more tired, tired. about this world mm -hmm. it's the fact we cannot blind uh, when you say societies is it uh, the e eu members well, uh, or beyond? look for for uh, the situation in some western uh, EU members, uh, but also in our region, mm -hmm. for example, Bulgaria, uh, Slovenia, uh, Slovakia, Czech Republic, but uh, from Western side, uh, Germany, Italy, France, Austria, uh, and uh, well, the, if uh, voters and taxpayers will be tired, and yeah. step by step also petitions uh, can be tired uh, about this war. It's the problem uh, for long term because uh, I think in our European interest we must uh, support uh, Ukraine. Uh, but if people get tired, how do you continue supporting well, Ukraine? Because that's well, such a good point. The, you know, it's the big problem and uh, hot potato. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that uh, in our common interest we should support uh, Ukraine mm -hmm. and and. Uh, uh, not uh, go uh, back. Indeed, absolutely. I want to go to you, Kilic. What conversations, I know you, you, you're not a, a Turkish diplomat, but just what conversations is Turkey having to, to end this war? They've done so well with their uh, diplomacy already to build on that, to put something in place to bring it to the end. So now, uh, first of all, there is an experience of Syria war. So to expect uh, in the conflict between Ukraine and Russia, to expect two sides to bleed each other out for a peace agreement will not be an ideal solution. And as honorable member of the European Parliament just mentioned, the impact of the wars to the societies mm -hmm. in the region. The tiredness as be, well. Time is, yep. time is the, also important. We see it in our region. Turkey has been experienced because of the war around its region, Syria, Iraq, the conflict in Iran, Armenia-Azerbaijan war. So when you look at all the whole region, Turkey has been facing significant negative effects. Those ne negative effects can be economic, those negative effects can be creating social tension, but more significantly it can export insecurity to whole region by different means. So uh, for Turkey, the most important thing I believe is to end this war as soon as possible. It, they believe, everybody believes that there should be a political solution for this conflict at the end of the day. And if the political solution can be achieved by some creative diplomacy, because we have seen for the last 20 years that economic sanctions and military interventions were considered as the only instruments of foreign policy among some countries. And I think we need to have now an innovative diplomacy, a creative diplomacy to end this war so that the people will not, people of Ukraine will not suffer from the negative effects of it, so that we will not see too many negative voices from Europe or other adjacent regions that feel the some sort of negative effects of this war. Thank you so much. I just want to end now by just getting your, your predictions one by one briefly. February the 24th, 2023, will mark a year since, uh, let's use the, the, the terms, Russia calls it a special military operation, others call it a war, invasion, incursion, I'll use the word war. Where will Ukraine be 
in two months' time? Your prediction, Mr. Czarnecki. Well, I think uh, this war will be a little bit frozen uh, during winter. Uh, both sides will uh, prepare for uh, uh, action again on March. Mm -hmm. uh, but my question is not about uh, what happened in Eastern Europe. My question is what happened in uh, European Union mm -hmm. and our uh, Western world, uh, because uh, I think the uh, uh, end of war there in Eastern Europe depends on our political will, mm -hmm. uh, our activities, our support. Good point. Thank you so much. Thomas, what, what, what are your predictions for the 24th of February next year? Uh, perhaps uh, uh, a more positive and a more negative point. I, I continue with the negative one. Uh, I, I'm afraid, you know, that we uh, still uh, in February we will still see a continuation of high-intensity warfare. You can unfortunately also uh, conduct this kind of warfare in winter time. You might not see uh, major uh, military movements, uh, but you know, uh, in Verdun. Um, you know, uh, uh, thousands uh, uh, and even millions of, of soldiers also died uh, uh, in all seasons. So I, I'm afraid we will still see, in particular because both sides uh, believe that the military momentum is on their side. Mm -hmm. you know, and just on this very point, there's a question that I, I love to ask. Um, that the US, NATO, has given Ukraine enough to fight, but not enough to win. Could that change by this t that time next year, by the 24th of February? Uh, I, I believe that the uh, United States and the West in general will continue to uh, support uh, Ukraine, uh, will carefully calibrate the type of support that is offered in order not to uh, um, create huge risks of further escalation. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the support uh, is uh, granted. And, and will continue for months and, if necessary, for, for, for years to go. Uh, but let me perhaps, uh, uh, you know, uh, end with, uh, uh, with a, a, a note uh, of, of uh, optimism, or at least with, with a hope, and, and that is that by um, February we will manage to break the current spir spiral of escalation. We are since last September since this September mm -hmm. in a spiral of escalation, um, partial mobilization, annexation, uh, targeting of, of mm -hmm. civilian uh, uh, targets, uh, attacks on the Kurdish mm -hmm. Strait Bridge, assassination of Dugana, now uh, more and more targeting of uh, targets on Russian territory. Mm -hmm. um, you Can know, I just it, ask it, one more thing? Because John Kirby said yesterday that he, the US is very concerned about the, the defense allegiance uh, between Russia and Iran. How could that escalate? What's happening in the war? Well, there is uh, uh, this fear, this concern uh, that you know uh, Iran would continue uh, to uh, uh, make available significant uh, uh, weapon systems to uh, the Russian Federation, and that this would sustain the, the, uh, the Russian war effort. In, in, in particular, of course, these uh, uh, attacks on key civilian infrastructure mm -hmm. in Ukraine. I think that is the concern uh, behind. But, you know, my final point... Uh, I'm asking all this all to you because you're in charge of security in, in Europe, so... Sure, uh, but, but the, the point is, in order to get uh, to a, a political environment where we even can start thinking of uh, coming back to the negotiation table, I think we need first to come to much more restraint mm -hmm. uh, on, on the battlefield and we need to somehow uh, uh, break out of the current spiral of mm -hmm. violence, uh, of, of escalation. And once this is done, I think we can carefully you know, start thinking about you know, how, uh, what could then happen at the negotiation uh, table, being aware that we have extremely complicated issues uh, at hand. It's not only territory, it's also status, security guarantees, Absolutely. it's possibly war crimes, it's uh, s certainly reparations, it's sanction relief. So All many this layers. is very complex. Indeed. So, um, 
Indeed. Thank you so much. Uh, I've asked you more than one question, more than one prediction. Evarist, what do you see happening uh, on the 24th of February next year, a year into this war? It's not realistic to expect countries like Turkey and China to broker a peace. I, don't, I think that is beyond expectations. Okay. And I think it's not realistic and I don't think it's fair unless the two main protagonists reach some kind of accommodation. Let's, let's put it like that. Number two, what I'd like to say, and this is looking forward, this is what is happening is part of a realignment of the world. It's as if a kind of old world is dying and a new one is being born. We are in between and that is, as good old Gramsci reminds us, that is the time for pathologies and turbulence and we're passing through, through that. My, my question is, how will the new reality emerge in terms of Russia, the weakening of Russia because of this war? possibly the weakening of the European Union. This might sound contradictory that I'm saying this. The because weakening of the European Union. In the sense that to a certain extent there is a newfound purpose of unity mm -hmm. to work together to support Ukraine. But what is going to happen economically? If we come out of this situation now with new energy uh, reality where it is becoming more expensive to produce and to manufacture things in the EU. And investment moves elsewhere where they will have a lower energy cost. What kind of new world will be, will be born? Thank you so much. Bruno, what do you see happening? You visit Ukraine regularly, but how do you see Yes, I, I, it I don't see any significant changes in the contact line. Uh, I don't expect any significant counter-offensives. I think Izium and Kherson were predicted and predictable, but I don't see that now. Uh, I'll see a more static contact line. Even if Russia occupies uh, Bakhmut, I don't think that's a significant change in the contact line. Both sides will probably, over 2023, focus more on the economic, industrial, and political side of the conflict build up their alliances with Iran in the case of Russia because it's the only alliance they have left and of course for Ukraine very important to continue to guarantee American support which is now looking a bit shakier and could become even shakier if the Republicans come back to power and Donald Trump in particular uh, concentrate on your industrial production because supplies are running low both in Ukraine in the US somewhat surprisingly in Europe and but more significantly in Russia, industrial supplies, uh, defense supplies, uh, and of course the economy, which will become now a very important part of the conflict. Will Ukraine's economy survive the pressure they're under? Mm -hmm. That's also why the Green Deal was important, release some of the pressure on Ukraine's economy, jobs and employment. Uh, and will Russia's economy survive? Because I think Russia's now entering a difficult period with oil prices going down. So I see that as becoming more and more important as the conflict drags on. Thank you so much, Bruno. Kilich, the last word to you on this panel now. Your predictions for February the 24th, one year anniversary of the Russia-Ukraine war. Just what to do you add see? one thing about the uh, role of Turkey. I think it would be not very rational to expect Turkey to fail. I think it would be rational to support Turkey's effort to end this war. That's one thing. Secondly, 2020, the, uh, we have seen significant changes and significant impacts of the war to the global setting. I think in the meantime, we have to look at what will happen in global food crisis, global energy crisis, and how the external actors will continue to play a role in this. The policy of the United States is one thing, but the cohesion of European Union is another thing. And the commitment of NATO is another factor. I think it will, the 2023 and the trajectory of the war will not be only shaped by the determination of Ukraine and Russia, but at the same time it will be those external actors and their reaction and their position in this war. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a, a fantastic panel.
It is a subject that is so challenging, so sensitive, so difficult, uh, with so many layers. Please join me in thanking my panel. Thank you so much. Richard Charnesky, Thomas Greminger, Evaris Bartolo, Kilic Burat Kanal, and Bruno Masaj. Thank you so much. And thank you to you, my audience. Thank you so much.